on, we'll talk about uh, quiver varieties and symplectic resolution of singularities. Yeah, great. Yeah. yeah thanks for the, the invitation to speak here to the organizers. It's been really nice being in Cambridge so far. Um, I was kind of conflicted in prepping the talk. I want to tell you this very beautiful mathematical story. And yet convention dictates that I speak about my own research. And so this talk is some kind of compromise between those two. Don't worry if you don't know any of the words in the title, I'm gonna kind of explain everything in due course and we'll have some working definitions. Uh, so things are kind of somewhat understandable. The talk split up into kind of three main ideas or sections. First section is that spaces that hopefully you care about can be realized as quiver variety. And that's kind of a nice idea already, maybe kind of spaces coming from different places like have this uniform description, but what is it by you? So that's what section two is for. Well, if you realize that something's a quiver variety, you're gonna have a leg up in terms of constructing symplectic resolutions of it. And not because of anything I did, part two is, uh, is work of uh, Gwen Bellamy and Travis Shedler that has kind of two parts. The hard part is they show in certain cases there aren't symplectic resolutions of singularities, but in all these other cases, you can kind of you can kind of build them. And then the third part of the talk is kind of some joint work with Travis Shedler pre-pandemic. And then it's also joint work in progress, something we're doing now, where the older idea was we noticed that some spaces could be locally realized as quiver variety. This is a lot less obvious what it buys you, but at least locally in a neighborhood, you understand what some local resolution is. So then the, the work in progress is taking this system of local resolutions and kind of gluing them together, or find some way of building some global resolution. And we have some obstruction theory, there's some kind of failures to do this, but there's some kind of uh, nice easy cases where you can kind of already say something interesting. Okay, so, um, so let's get started with one. We're gonna do a series of examples that are all the same example. So example one A, and then when we do B, it will look a little bit different, but will be the same. So. so we can have uh, Z2 acting on two-dimensional space. Taking XY to minus XY. And then this gives you an action on functions which, okay, right now it's gonna look goofy, but today will be written like this. That's kind of bad. So let's pick a basis, uh, X and Y, of polynomials and two variables. And now you're just acting uh, on the source. Something like that. And so the polynomials that are invariant with respect to this action have even degree. So if you'd like, you know, generated by uh, x squared, y squared, x, y. And then if you just give these different names, you'll notice that there's some relation they satisfy. I mean, you don't have to give them different names. The point is u times v. Oops. Uh, is w squared. Okay, so we have this um, kind of simple uh, or, some, or sometimes A1 singularity. And in this situation, you can blow up the origin. Um, I don't know, I guess I think about everything in terms of, uh, in terms of these rings, but actually uh, I should take spec of this maybe.
And at least in this small case, this blow up actually works and then you get something smooth. And then this is your resolution of singularity. And the examples maybe I really want you to have in mind by writing this small example is you can take other groups, maybe finite subgroups of SL2 and then get other interesting Duval singularities. Because we'll head in a symplectic resolution of singularity, maybe you should think of them not being in SL2, but in SP2. You can't see the difference here, but that genuinely will matter in higher dimensions. Okay, so uh, let, let's do it again differently now. So we'll consider this space. Uh, this nilpotent cone of SL2. So I have matrices, two by two, uh, maybe say complex entries. And then the being an SL2 is saying that the trace is zero. And being nilpotent is saying the determinant zero. And then I again get some equation. Um, well, okay, the trace is zero. So this D is minus a, and now the determinant. Okay, uh, uh, same equation as before. Uh, okay, maybe change the sign or something. And so um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna blow anything up, so to speak. I'll think about it a little differently, but achieve the same thing. So, um, Uh, we'll take pairs like this. So M matrix from before, and then L uh, a line in the kernel. I can at least project onto the first factor to hit M, which was my uh, so this is uh, in my neopotent cone. Oh, sorry, just, just quickly, the, the content that this is a cone is that it has this zero, this cone point, and then it has a contracting C star action. Um, I don't know, depending on what I get, two cones might come up later. Uh, so yeah, the claim is that this is uh, T star, the cotangent bundle to P1. That, that maps to this. And it is doing, I guess, the same thing that this map is doing up here. So um, I guess I need some more board space. The, the zero kind of any line here uh, is mapping to zero. So this is kind of my P1 getting crushed to the, to the point. So, so maybe I actually won't argue why this is a cotangent bundle, but at the very least, you know, you can project onto the second factor instead. You have some bundle over P1, but then you need to do some computation of a clutching function or something to realize that it's a cotangent bundle. And now that we have this second perspective, there's a whole different class of examples that might come to your mind of ways to generalize this. So we can put in other Lie algebras and get other neopotent cones. Um, okay. So the third example might, which again is the first example, might have to go on hiatus for a bit because now we're going to realize everything from a quiver perspective, but then I need to actually maybe go to the sideboard and give some definitions. Um, I'm also a little bit indecisive in my prep. There's kind of two ways I can do this with quivers. Let me do the non-frame version. Um, and yeah, okay, let's 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 do some things about quivers first, then we'll come back. Okay, so this is section two, which is now going to run simultaneous to section one. We'll kind of move back and forth. 
So a quiver is just a fancy word for a directed graph and it has the data of a vertex set, a set of arrows, and the arrows differ from say being edges and that we have two maps, source and target. Like this, but I'll just draw them something like this. So I'll try to label, okay, vertex set one, two, arrow set A, B, source of A is one, target of A is two. Okay. The next part of the story is that you fix the dimension vector. So this is a, a tuple in the vertices of, of natural numbers. Maybe I'll just write it like this sometimes. And then we need to fix a field too for this construction, but I'll just work over the complex numbers today. Okay. So to the data of all three of these things, the, the notion of the field is suppressed here, but um, quiver dimension vector and field, uh, you get this space of C linear maps from, uh, uh, what, what am I summing over the arrows in the quiver? Uh, Okay, great. So I have a space, an affine space. I'm thinking about the vector space assigned to the vertices as being some fixed thing. And then what's varying in this space is how I choose these maps. This has a perfectly good action of um, GD, the product of the general linear groups at the vertices. Um, and it's acting by conjugation essentially, so. So I, I take like whatever I have on the source, then I do the math and then uh, what's on the target, maybe with an inverse somewhere. And maybe just a quick remark um, kind of level zero thinking about this action is I have a uh, C star sitting inside GM as just, um, you know, the, all of these identity matrices. I um, mean, this acts trivially. Okay, so sometimes you mod out by this uh, part of the action because it's acting trivially. And it seems like at this point, the construction should be done and the quiver variety should be these representations, mod the group with some definition of mod. And there's, there's kind of an issue right now. So the remark is that the GD orbit are too big, uh, too big in the sense that we're the quotient's uh, kind of not going to notice the geometry in a way that I'll make more precise maybe here. So, example. Just take a quiver like this. Perfectly good representation. Um, the specific things I write here it don't really matter in a way you'll see. Maybe. Okay, so A, B, and C are some matrices. And the point is it's hard to cook up GD invariant functions on this representation space. So to this representation, there's something I can do um, that's maybe the first thing you would think to do. So to the representation, you assign the trace of the map B. This is perfectly good GD invariant function. 
And once you have this one, then you're like, okay, well, I could maybe square that and add another version. So I can take polynomials in this trace, but then that, that's it. And so the sense in which this is too big is that uh, functions on this space that are actually GD invariant are just polynomials in the traces of the cycles. So we're not, we're missing out on the geometry. We're maybe seeing some topology of this quiver and nothing else. And then for a lot of smaller cases you care about like Dinkin quivers or trees, there really are just constant functions. And so in order to get something interesting that we want to call a quiver variety, we're going to need to try harder and do kind of a little bit more than that. But okay, not that much more. We're going to double the quiver now. So that's what I'll do. Um, Maybe, well, let's see how much I want to say. Okay, I'll have to erase a board to do this. We'll return to this example. How about? Uh, questions up until now? Um, so, okay, the, what the doubling procedure does, say I want to double this quiver, Every time I see an arrow, I just draw an arrow back. And normally if this arrow has a name like A, the arrow back has the name A star. And if you have a loop, you need to also draw another loop with B star. Okay, so, so that's doubling. In terms of the space of representations, this affine space, what have we really done when we doubled the quiver? Well, a new representation is going to have homs kind of the, the original direction and now plus some homs back. Definitely the original space sits inside this. Plus the representations of the opposite quiver. These were the arrows A star that went back. And this is the dual space. So I have some vector space plus its dual, which sometimes gets a name like a cotangent bundle to the vector space. Okay, um, I, I didn't do any of the maps. So just restrict. Um, just quickly, in terms of this non-degenerate pairing, uh, maybe just as some scratch work on the side is that if you give me homes from a vector space V to W, and then I have homs back from W to V. I can just compose them and then take a trace. I guess compose in either order, then take a trace. And so this is a perfectly good non-degenerate pairing. And this is kind of the uh, first approximation to what the pairing is uh, on, on these two spaces. You just take a sum over all your arrows and then take trace. And it's a perfectly good non-degenerate pairing. Okay, the upshot, we added a bunch of cycles in, so we won't run into this issue. We're going to see more about the quiver. But um, also, crucially, we now entered the setting of symplectic geometry, because now I have a cotangent bundle and some symplectic form on it. And so the next reasonable question to ask is, what's the moment map? Where does it live? Most naturally, it goes to the dual of the Lie algebra. But actually, that's not really where I think about it as living. And so um, j j just for the purpose of this talk now, I'll just compose with a map like this that also uses a trace. It's kind of important how I identify this Lie algebra with its dual. It's not just something I can do as vector spaces. These, 
these have G of D, capital G of D actions on them. This has like adjoint orbits, co-adjoint orbits. I need to identify all this stuff. So I need to identify them as G D spaces, which is why you got to pick something like a trace. But now, um, okay, so here's like my representation row of the double quiver. And then this is a bunch of matrices. And so, so what does this do? It evaluates the representation just on a single quadratic element R, an evaluation map. Um, uh, maybe if you'd like, I haven't actually said how to kind of the right location of where these arrows compose. Um, and so to, to any of these quivers, you have a notion of path algebra. It's an associative algebra. The composition is the multiplication is composition of paths. If paths don't compose, they multiply as zero. If the quiver has finitely many vertices, it's unital with the unit in degree zero, the sum of all the idempotents at the vertices. But anyways, the whole point of introducing this algebra is that its modules correspond to representations of the quiver. And now when I say there's some quadratic element here, the place I'm viewing it or need to view it as in, is in this path algebra of the double quiver. So it looks like this. This is sometimes called like a mesh or pre-projective relation. Uh, and so what lives in the zero fiber of this moment map? So this began its life as a representation of a quiver or a representation of a, of a path algebra. It lives in the zero fiber of this moment map if it evaluates to zero on this element. So descends to the quotient where I mod out by this element. So this is in the zero fiber if um, a module. So I started in symplectic geometry. I'm just trying to tell the algebraic version of the story here quickly, because we're going to need that. And we're going to modify the algebraic situation a little bit. OK, module for this uh, pre-projective algebra for the quiver. This is the definition. OK, now I, I feel like I've said a lot and have been talking for a while. So let me just pause and see if there's questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I should just write this out every time. It's the quadratic element that's this commutator. So the square brackets was commutator. So these are these are paths, and then I can compose to get a length two path. What these relations are telling me is I start at a point, every way I can leave and come back, that sums to zero. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I never pick C, so yeah, thank you. It probably in a bunch of places. I should just write K equals C somewhere. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Well, actually, part of what's beautiful about this story, at least so far, is you don't need to pick C. I mean, you can, yeah. We're going to we're going to do GIT in a minute. Um, yeah, I, I kind of I, I want to say yes, but maybe I think it's no <laughs> in my heart. So basically, um, yeah, OK, let me I, I'm recorded. So let me not say anything wrong besides what I've already done wrong. OK, so.
The thing that's going to be the quiver variety is we're going to restrict to the zero fiber of the moment math, and then we're going to mod out by the group. But then this might be also a kind of a GIT situation. So this is my small mu that's like the moment math. This is my like uh, math cal m that's for the quiver variety. Uh, yep. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, th th this was um, this was not how I should have written it. Let me write it in a way that clarifies what this actually is. So I don't feed it to this element. I feed it individually to the first path, compose with the second, and then subtract the other way. Okay, and then this is honest what you're actually supposed to do. Yeah. If yeah, if you define it to be behave this way with respect to composition, then I guess everything's okay. Okay. Uh, good. Other questions? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, so I never said it when I doubled the quiver, but I still have my GD acting here and still by conjugation. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, sorry, there, there's one other piece of information that's coming in from the setting of GIT, but uh, kind of King has this theory of stability conditions that in a way just like obfuscates what Mumford's uh, stability condition actually is, but it's combinatorial. So it's very nice and easy to read off. So, uh, okay, let's, let's do it here maybe. Erase some examples. Hey, we can erase these examples. Um, so, okay, what's the point with Mumford's? Like, I, I have row representation. I take its orbit, so hit it with everything in GD, get some space, and then I want to know, is zero in the closure of this orbit? If zero is in the closure, this is bad, and then I call it unstable, and I want to throw it out. Um, Okay, so so King following Mumford. So a subref is destabilizing. Or maybe theta destabilizing. Okay, well, there's an issue already with the definition. Theta is going to be an element uh, in here. And I'm going to choose theta so that it's dot product with the dimension vector uh, is zero. And sorry, maybe the point with this space is you're supposed to actually think about it as characters. Yeah. And then I had this kind of pesky issue that I said the diagonal in here acts trivially. Uh, and then that should be reflected in this equation. Yeah, that this dots to zero. There's actually a different way to do this that doesn't have this restriction, but let's do it this way. This is how King did it. Um, so a sub representation is theta destabilizing if when you take its dimension vector and you dot it with theta, you get something positive. And then uh, this is uh, rho is theta semi-stable. 
if um, there does not exist um, rope, a destabilizing subspace. Okay. Okay, so maybe now, now we've said enough to say what the quiver variety is. So yeah, let's. I'll, okay, I'll do it as a. I'll do it as a proj. But the point is, I'm taking the zero fiber of the moment map, maybe with a D here. Then I'm taking its functions. And then I want to take the invariant ones, but, uh, but this way with semi invariants. Okay, we did a lot of work. It took a lot of my talk, most of it, to write this down. So this, this needs to have some benefit. And the, the benefit is that I have, I have this additional parameter theta that I can set to zero. And when I do, I'm gonna get something singular. And then in nice cases, when I turn on this theta and make it generic or something, I can get something smooth with a map from the smooth thing to the singular thing. The map's coming from just taking something that's a theta semi-stable representation and just regarding it as a representation again. So it, just at the level of kind of functions here, I have the map. Okay, there's uh, kind of some unhappy faces. It's all going to make more sense because we're going to go back and do this example one. So, so let's, yeah, let's do this. Okay. Um. Okay, let's take a dimension vector, so D11. And so I'm just thinking about uh, two linear maps like this. And let's take, uh, let's take theta to be, I need it to dot with this to be zero. And so there's not so many choices, but let's do one minus one. And so the only thing that could be destabilizing here is if I somehow had kind of C sitting inside of here and then a zero there. And the content that this is a sub representation is that I just restrict um, the vector spaces and then restrict the maps. I mean, here the maps just have to be zero. But I need the diagram to actually commute. And so this thing that would be destabilizing only exists if A and B are zero. So, so theta semi-stable. Um, kind of, if and only if. I haven't proven that. So the, the point is, is supposed to be that I have a P1 um, in A and B, the ratio of the two maps that I can kind of identify, at least with these uh, theta semi-stable ones. I, there's no GD here. So, so what group is acting? I kind of missed that. I have a C star at each vertex and it's just rescaling. So. This maybe should have been mentioned right from the start. If you take your dimension vector to be all ones, then the thing your GD is, is actually a torus. So then you're kind of in the set, the toric setting. And so that's kind of a particularly nice situation. 
but then we have kind of the ability here to generalize beyond that. Um, sorry, this is how I get my, my P1 is the point, is I'm taking these two maps, but I, I, can, I can rescale them kind of simultaneously. And so that's kind of where my lines are coming from. I also never doubled the quiver. I really didn't follow any of the procedure that I said I would follow. So uh, yeah, I, I can see uh, this would be confusing. The, the doubling kind of miraculously here in other cases can kind of be done before and after. So somehow you get a, you get a cotangent bundle if you double just the affine space of representations, but if you double here, you will get a cotangent bundle to P1. And um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a quick way of, of saying it, but, but we'll have our A and B, our A star, our B star. I said they should satisfy some relations. So A, A star plus B, B star equals zero, A star A. Plus B star B equals zero. If I'm only looking at one dimensional representations where these are maps from C to C, the, this is commutative. These are the same equations. And this is my simple singularity recovered again. So if I have no stability condition, I set theta equal to zero, then I'm going to recover this equation. And then it's, it's not so carefully explained on the board, but when, at least when I turn on the stability parameter, I should get something like this, where I've kind of at least told you that this is going to be AB, and so the other coordinates will be you know, A star, B star in the fiber direction. Okay. Okay, I'm not personally thrilled with this presentation, but let me just pause, see if there's questions, and then we'll move on kind of to the next bit of the talk. We got pretty zoomed in. So zooming back out, we're trying to realize spaces as quiver varieties. And then there's a claim here that once we do that, then it's well understood. And so this is the work of uh, Bellamy and Shedler that I should now explain. But I also need 10 minutes to do this. And so I'm going to do just a very quick crash course on Bellamy Shedler. We won't kind of linger. And then once we're back at three, there will be kind of some concrete examples that we can get our, our hands around. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, this is a good point. So the, the place that the, yeah, the place that the relations came from were here. So this was supposed to be this kind of form of commutators, except I've taken R and I've multiplied it by an item potent at each vertex to write it as kind of two equations. The content that you're in the zero fiber of the moment map is saying that these equations are zero because this is the image of the moment map. So the sum of these two things is the, is the image of the moment map. And that's the thing I'm requiring to be zero. You're in some special situation where these live in different direct summons. And so saying their sum is zero is saying each uh, individual piece is zero. There's no way for me to relate kind of this path that goes A, A star to this one that goes A star A, because they have different source and target. So they're, uh, they're unrelated and different components in this algebra. Okay, this was a good question. I hope that clarified a bit. Other questions? Okay, I'm just thinking of how to do Bell and the Shedler in five minutes. So, um, okay, I think maybe like this, actually. I think I can do it. Um, okay, I'm going to erase. Uh, it's been a while since I've been over there. I'll go to the sideboard for a minute. Uh, 
there's a lot of good ideas in their paper, which is why it's maybe hard to summarize. But a, a huge thing that they use is a decomposition theorem where they take a quiver variety and they write it as a product of quiver varieties that have smaller dimension vector. This is pretty crucial. Once you get it as a product, you only need individual symplectic resolutions built on each component of the product, and then you're good. And so it's a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly important simplification. And it's an idea that really goes back to crawley Bovey which maybe reminds me while I'm saying this, I'm talking about this paper of Bellamy Shedler, but they were kind of using this older paper of um, Kaladin, Learn, and Sorge. In Sorger. So th they were working in the setting of, of uh, sheaves on K3 surfaces, but they had like kind of all of the right ideas in the setting. And then uh, Travis and Gwen Bellamy kind of generalized stuff. It's also worth noting some earlier work in the 80s of, of CAC, where they he's able to make statements like, when is this like non-zero? When is this non-empty? Which is already like, uh, yeah, kind of completely non-obvious. Oops. Okay. Okay, so this is, I guess for the first time in the talk, I'm actually writing down results. It's a theorem. Bellamy Shedler, this um, uh, decomposes. So it's a product over. I think I'll, I'll say it like this. Yeah, it's some product over symmetric spaces. So if I have, um, if I have X, then um, this space is taking a product of N copies of X and then modding out by the permutation group. Um, what are the DI and the NI? So it turns out for this dimension vector, so this is something that's positive um, and it can be broken down into some minimal sum of things that stay positive. Sorry, what does minimal mean? If you give me some other sum, I can kind of further refine it to get this one. Um, but the point is that I still need these like di to dot with theta to give zero. So there's some restrictions. I can't just go down to the atoms of like one, zero, 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 and that kind of stuff. But, but you can go down pretty close. Um, so sorry, these are vectors and they're appearing, appearing with multiplicity ni. And then th this decomposition is kind of part one of the theorem, but th the main thing that they prove is that um, this has a symplectic resolution uh, if and only if each of these do. And there's just two, you just look at combinatorial conditions. So it's the case if the GCD of all these DIs is one, then there's going to be a symplectic resolution. There's one other kind of strange case. Um, it, it's, it's bizarre, really. You take this GCD uh, and you get two, and then you compute an another number that I didn't have time in the talk to say, but kind of the Euler form applied to this vector. If this is two, two, 
you get this strange uh, 10 dimensional example. The whole point of the story that you get this uniform description of symplectic resolutions, this falls apart in this one example. There's no resolution of this as a quiver variety, but it happens to have a symplectic resolution of singularity. You can get it by blowing up its singular locus, which so far as anyone can tell has no quiver variety description. So we're too much in the weeds with this one example, but it's like sufficiently interesting where like I would need to mention it in a talk. And then this example where the GCD of all these DIs is one, and then in any other case, there's no symplectic resolution and you can prove there's none, but you can still do a classification with kind of the next best thing where the thing you uh, that's resolving isn't actually quite smooth, but, but there's still some notion in which it's nicer. Okay, so let's go to part, uh, to part three of the talk. Um, so, okay, we're, I'm going to erase kind of some of the boards here. And where does the story start? It was, I was a PhD student with Travis. And um, I was thinking about a multiplicative version of this pre-projective algebra that had different relations that was some multiplicative version. It had the same degree two piece and then higher order terms. And I was thinking purely algebraically, and I, we were trying to prove that this was a two clubby algebra. And we got like in some cases this, if the quiver contained a cycle. But the, the reason this was interesting potentially for quiver variety people is that a complete two clubby algebra is a completed pre-projective algebra. And it turns out the kind of, this is the level zero idea of a kind of slightly more complicated, definitely harder to prove idea, where if you zoom in a bunch on a variety of modules for this multiplicative thing, you're seeing the quiver variety. You're seeing a formal neighborhood of a quiver variety. So I'll, I'll write that down. And what that's gonna tell us is that we'll get these kind of formally local uh, resolutions of singularities and a lot of spaces, let me, let me just say it more basically, because it's actually just, it's a very kind of foundational idea. So you have some singular space, you're looking at all the singularities and you realize they're all Duval. So each Duval singularity has some unique symplectic resolution of singularities. How do you then say that like these glue in the right way to give a global resolution of singularities? Well, what we're working on is the local to global formulation, but the kinds of obstructions you can run into only occur if you have multiple resolutions in place. If there's a unique one, it really does kind of extend across the space. And so let me kind of write that down as a theorem, say one or two more ideas, and then I should stop soon. So, uh, okay, let's use the big boys. And while I'm doing this, I'll just pause for questions, uh, maybe about any of the stuff I said. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, there's basically no condition. They're also positive. So you're taking the positive root and you're breaking it up as a sum of still positive roots. Yeah, you need this di dot. If you go read their paper, they'll have another parameter. I was trying to save you guys by not turning on all the parameters that are there. So there's a lambda. You can look at different fibers of the moment map. That's your deformation parameter. And then the story goes through with the lambda, but you need the di's to dot with lambda to be zero and the d to dot with lambda to be zero. Anyways, I don't know if I saved you guys particularly well, but I, I did turn off a couple of, of things. So let's. Um, 
Okay. So this was the older work that was kind of a germ of an algebraic idea. It was that, hmm. So I can put any algebra kind of into this data with also a D and the data. Okay, maybe not any algebra, a path algebra of a double quiver, mod some relations. And I kind of asked that this be the moduli space of theta semi-stable A modules of dimension D. And so now I'm gonna put in a different algebra than before, the, this multiplicative thing. And this little hat is that I'm gonna choose some M in here and look at the formal neighborhood around that. And there's an isomorphism as, uh, as Poisson varieties. Oh yeah, that's another thing I forgot to say. The smooth locus here is symplectic, and then you have a stratification by symplectic leaves, and you have a Poisson variety kind of globally on the whole space. But this is kind of some, this is just some local statement. So like a formal, formal uh, Poisson variety, isomorphic to the usual, which I've been denoting without this. Except we didn't quite, oh, and you need to complete this and you get to complete at zero. So you look at the representation where you have vector spaces of the dimensions, but then you turn all the maps to zero. And we didn't quite get this. We definitely know it's true for at least some other quiver and some other dimension vector and potentially another stability condition. But in some nice cases, we know they agree. Um, and, uh, Okay, anyways, in, in, in some cases. And so here is kind of the strategy in the up in the upshot of what we're doing. So lo local local to global obstructions. Yeah, um, so it was supposed to be the multiplicative pre-projective algebra. If you take your algebra and you stray too far away from geometry, maybe bad things will happen. This isn't that far away. This is the, this is the fiber of the, of the unit in the group valued moment map within the same formula, but it just produces some algebra that you can think about purely algebraically. And then I think it was Vandenberg that proved the thing I just said about the relation to the group valued moment map. I should know that. Um, uh, so this product is now equal to one, not zero. You're taking a product over the arrows and you need to do some localization where you invert certain, uh, certain elements that don't a priori live in here, but live in some completed version. Okay. If I want to tell you how to how to take the product with respect to arrows, like in a non-commutative world, I need to put some order on the arrows. So the first thing that Crowley, Bovey, and Shaw proved after they defined this is that the choice of order on the arrows doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the isomorphism class of the algebra. Um, okay, local to global obstructions. So I'm in the setting of X, uh, which I was kind of saying was Poisson. So it has some stratification by symplectic leaves. One unfortunate thing happened recently is that we realized that we don't really need symplectic leaves. It should work for more stratifications. So now we're trying to figure out <laughs> the consequences of this, but it seems like some things are gonna work in the setting of Crepin resolutions instead of symplectic resolutions. And then, uh, at least I don't know the literature as well there. So we were like asking people if they know about these kinds of results, but they, I mean, no one seems to know anything. So I think we're okay. 
Um, so here's what can happen. You take one of these strata and you, you pick a point in it, a little SI, and you look at its fundamental group. And its fundamental group is gonna act on a set of these local resolutions. So more precisely for this point SI, I choose a, li a little neighborhood or maybe even a formal neighborhood, USI, the one that agrees uh, with the quiver variety set up so that then I can write down a map like this. And actually this fundamental group is allowed to act non-trivially where it kind of changes um, the these resolutions but it, it can't change the isomorphism type. And you have a different action in this setup uh, by a, a Nakajima wild group. And then if you kind of look up to that action, uh, then any non-trivial um, movement that's happening here is an obstruction to, what is an obstruction to doing? Starting at a point in your leaf and extending it to the rest of the leaf. And so, these local to global obstructions come in two parts. First, we have it in a neighborhood and we want to send it to the rest of the leaf. And I'm saying you can almost do that except for the fundamental group, changing what resolution you get when you come back and ignore what I said here. I maybe shouldn't have even mentioned that. The second thing that can happen is you can choose things incompatibly in different leaves. And so you need a, uh, compatibility uh, on uh, leaf closures. But th this is just what you would expect it to be. If I take the closure of some leaf and it contains another one, then I just need to make sure whatever resolution I have on the bigger thing, Sorry, that's not its name. The resolution on the bigger thing denoted like this, when restricted to the smaller thing, has to agree with whatever the resolution is on the smaller thing. And so the strategy, because of this leaf closure thing, is to go to minimal, uh, go to minimal size leaves, pick things there, and then you can kind of build up. Okay, I have uh, maybe one or two minutes left. So just uh, let me just say one example for why this is interesting. So now we're not in the affine space with group action. I'm in the Taurus case with group action. So kind of genuinely not the quiver variety story. Okay, I can act by something like this inversion, and then the singularities in the quotient space. Are going to correspond to the fixed points of this action, which are just plus and minus one plus or minus one, so I have four fixed points here. But the point is each one of these singularities is a simple singularity. And so. Over each of these, I locally have a unique resolution. And then when I go to stare at what my obstructions are potentially to extending this, well, there's not multiple things here. So there's no issue with extending across a leaf. And there's no compatibility issue because there's no two choices on some neighborhood. So then in this kind of setting, um, our work implies there exists unique uh, symplectic resolution of singularities. Of course, this example is small and is likely known to experts or maybe everyone, but you can imagine there's tons of other examples you can write down of this form. And we have a couple of others where you have some open subset of something where the symplectic resolutions are known and you observe that you have the same symplectic leaves and then you run the story and it goes through. And so hopefully I've convinced you that maybe there's something interesting here, even potentially at the lack of clarity. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Are there questions?
Zoom questions or? So this is a personal question you have in this theorem that the Q equals Q prime in type AN. Um, are you able to do like other, like a type D quiver? Yeah, so uh, yeah, what's the point here? Let me think about this for a second. One of the reasons we didn't go after seeing if these quivers were the same in dimension vectors and stability condition was that for part of the applications below, we just wanted to get some, um, just get some quiver variety. But, uh, but in this case, something much nicer happened where, uh, what, what's the point? Yeah, the, this multiplicative thing ended up being an open subset sitting inside of it. And then that's how we saw that, I, I just wrote here, the quivers are the same, but I meant that uh, everything, everything aligns. And yeah, so we've kind of, con we've conjectured, conjectured in this paper that, you know, re really these should always agree. We, we don't have any example or expectation that you should have to take a different quiver here. It was more just an issue of how do we kind of prove this and we didn't get it. And then we're like, oh, maybe we secretly don't need it. And we, we stopped thinking, but yeah, this is a good question. So I think this is the only case I'm super confident about. And then I, I have some suspicion that if your quiver contains a cycle like this, we can probably also get it. Yeah, but yeah, this is a good question. Um, other questions? Is there any hope for understanding this for just like being able to bootstrap down to like sub representations of the same quiver and maybe understanding the spaces of GIT quotients of spaces of sub representations like quiver Grassmannians? Yeah, this is a good question. So. Yeah, the reason I'm thinking here is I actually haven't thought about this question. I think it's a great one. And yeah, there's definitely some hope to doing that. Um, it seems like, it, yeah, it seems like the harder thing, yeah, the harder thing to do would be to do it here, but maybe there's some examples where it's easier and then you can do exactly what you're saying. So yeah, I should think about this and we can chat about it. So that's a good, good point. Are there other questions? Not like to thank the speaker again. We need to go.